Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll call uh, we'll call the meeting to order. We'll call the meeting to order at 6 31. We begin this meeting by acknowledging that we are on land that's been inhabited by Anishinaabek nations. We'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is a traditional territory of the Sagamok Anishinaabek, and we would like to give thanks for sharing this land. Whereas there is a quorum of council present and the time is 6.30 p.m., we resolve that this regular meeting be open for business and that the minutes of the regular meeting of March 8, 2023 be approved. Can I have a motion? Harold, uh, Councillor Krabs, Councillor Fairburn, second. All in favor? Very good. Disclosure of pecuniary interest in uh, general nature. Any declarations? None being heard. Uh, we have a delegation uh, from the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. Um, Jennifer Legrandeur, could you uh, go ahead? Is John, is John here tonight? He was supposed to be. He's still on his way, I'm assuming, but I can go ahead and start. Yeah, go ahead. Like. That's okay. fine. Thank you. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I wasn't sure if you were putting it up or do you just want me to talk. It's fine either way. Yeah. There's nothing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to start off by refreshing everybody about what the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan is. So a few years ago, the townships of Sable Spanish River, Marin and Hyman, Baldwin and Espanola have got together and hired a consulting firm to do a research project on what the needs of our community were, where the gaps were, and they conducted a whole bunch of research information for this. And we decided to form a project called the Community Safety Wellbeing Plan. This project is going to help identify these gaps and really, really encourage our community to see 
and create awareness of what programs we actually have that's available for services, whether it's healthcare services or social services out in the community. So when this consulting firm came, they went out into the communities and did a community engagement in sessions with community agencies, municipal agencies, and members of the public. And it was just kind of randomly done. And data was collected and it identified four pillars or priority risk factors for our communities. The first one was mental health and addictions. The second was one affordable housing. The third was access to services. And the fourth was seniors in our communities. So with, with that, the government, the province of Ontario put out some framework. <laughs> they started, they handed out some framework for us and they gave us a structure of what we needed to follow in those priorities. So social development, development was one of our first pillars, which means promoting and maintaining community safety and well-being. The second pillar was prevention. So we need to proactively reduce identified risks in our communities. The risk intervention, so mitigating situations of elevated risk. And then incident response, which is critical and non-critical responses. So with that framework, we're going to have this strategic focus using community partnerships with all of our community members and other services and form co good working collaborations to focus on these priorities and try to come up with ways to increase awareness and engagement with the communities. The next one is community awareness, awareness and community outreach. So making sure that we get into each four communities rather than everything being in Espanola or everything being in Massey, we're going to make sure that everything's available to all communities. That's, that's the plan. And community engagement, just really making sure our members are aware of all of the services that are available, all the programs we have out there, and realizing that we actually have a lot more going for us than people realize. So really, I'm just going to give you a quick update on some of the programs and initiatives we have started with this program. So the first thing that I have been working on is a safe handoff with the OPP and the Emerge Department in Espanola. So this program is going to organize a committee of hospital staff and a series of different training staff and OPP, paramedics, and we're going to come up with a process to hand off mental health patients to emerge safely from our OPP officers. So nurses feel safe, OPP feel safe, everybody, the patient feels safe at the handoff that everything's being taken care of. The second project we're working on is service mapping. mapping. It's called for a red book that I'm working on. So it's really asset mapping what we have in the community, like I was talking about. So creating a database of all the services, all the programming and making it accessible to everyone. This could even help the OPP out a lot by having this in a like a, an app on your phone where they can just type it in and see what services are right here in our community for these patients that they come across for clients that they come across. Um, we did a community health contact list. Um, the mayor of Espanola had requested that. He wanted a list of numbers that were, it was, I'm calling it like a babysitter list. So it was a list that when you leave the house and you just give your important numbers that we hand this out to people with important numbers rather than just calling 911 or sending, calling an ambulance, we just want people to know that there's services that they can reach and kind of solve their own problems or help others in the community by solving these. So we gave a list of all the mental health and addictions programs or DSAB numbers, anything like that. And I know I've handed them out in Massey. I probably haven't reached every place yet, but the majority of businesses have been reached. Um, then we're working on a community outreach program with the brand program in family health team. So we're getting that, we're making that available in each community once a month. So it's a rapid access addictions medicine program. So anybody with any addictions issues can for here we're we're going to be using an office at the clinic. We have set it up with Marlo and or Marla, sorry, and she's going to provide us a space and people can walk in and just get information even if they want, or they can have an appointment with the addictions navigator. So hopefully that will be coming in the next few months once all the policies are worked out. And each community is getting that as well. So we have talked with Naren and, and Makaro, we're even going to do one in Webwood and we're going to reach all the communities. Um, we're working on a bike exchange and a bike rodeo. So I'm meeting with the Municipal Association next week. 
and we're going to be bringing it up to see where they would like to have. We're going to try to do two this year and three maybe the next. And we're going to see which communities will have them this year. We're just going to have that discussion. So once we know that, you'll start seeing advertisements and marketing material out for that. With that bike rodeo, we want to have like a trade show type thing with community services. So there's many community services that are around here. We're going to try to get them to set up booths and come out so that people can see what's really available and maybe get information, right? Uh, I don't yeah. What is a bike rodeo? Okay, so the bike rodeo and the bike exchange. Mm -hmm. So um, Sessions from Sudbury has been fixing up a whole bunch of old bikes that have been donated. And they've been fixing them and we're going to give them out to people who don't have bikes. We're going to give helmets out as well. And then the OPP will be there and we're going to try to have some bike safety and some of that for the children and try to get that type of engagement to get the community to come out. And then they can see all the services that are available as well. It's just trying to pull people in. We're trying to maybe piggyback off of something that each community has going on, like so that it's a bigger event and draws more people in just to really create awareness because the programs that you guys have available to you here are huge. It's just nobody knows about them. So we really we need, we need to push that. Um, we're working on, I'll start, I'll go back to the bikes. So we did purchase two bikes for OPP officers so that they can start doing patrol on bikes during the summertime. So those will, they're going to training soon and that will start, I think, I was talking to Jessica, I think like they're thinking April, May, like the end of April, beginning of May, they'll start those. And then we have the transportation project that the town of Espanola had initiated. And I've been working with Joseph Burke on this project. So he put in an application, I'm sure you guys have all talked about this. The application went in. Um, we don't think we'll hear anything back until July for that application now. But once we do, then we'll have to discuss purchasing a vehicle and yeah. hopefully have it up and running by 2024. It just keeps getting a little bit delayed, but yeah. it's still coming. <laughs> do you have anything to add, John? <laughs> no, just uh, I think that there's been a lot of really, really great work uh, that has been happening uh, in a short amount of time. We've been able to put this project together. Um, Jen has been doing a lot of exceptional work. Uh, and I think that the real key here is that, you know, this was brought to our attention by by DSAF, so the District Services Board, that there's so many amazing programs that are actually happening and that are available, but we're just not doing a very good job promoting ourselves. Uh, and I think that that's been one of the really big keys for me is saying, we just need to get out into the communities and let people know what's available. Right now, it's, you know, that a lot of people are like, oh, we don't have this, we don't have that. Well, a lot of those services are actually available to you, and more specifically around the information that's happening with DSAB, and I think of the seniors, uh, and a lot of, like I said, there's just, there's a lot that is available that's not being accessed, uh, and sometimes a lot of those funds are not being completely depleted because people just don't know what they're doing. So, uh, really just that community outreach piece and really trying to piggyback off of what's going to be happening with these bike exchanges and bike rodeos, I think is going to be really key for the community. It's an opportunity where you can essentially show up, um, kids, adults can show up and get a free bike. Uh, I think a really great opportunity to show up with, you know, small children, they come in, we set them up with a bike that fits them, we give them a helmet, they're passed off to the OPP, the OPP run them through, you know, a series of like, what do you do when you approach just a railroad tracks or, or, you know, just safe biking uh, in a community. And at the same time, you have a whole bunch of booths that are set up with all of the health and social service agencies that are there can, that can really demonstrate, you know, these are a lot of the programs that we have to offer. So our thought is it's going to be a captured audience. You're going to have parents that are going to be there that are bringing their children to get this bike and then are going to be, you know, working through this rodeo. Uh, and at the same time, then we can start talking to them about all the various programs that are available. So I think that's really going to be the biggest key for us is that we just need to get out into the communities and really demonstrate a lot of the things that are already available. And I think that's going to help us identify gaps as well. Because a lot of times right now, we we think we know what we, what we need to be starting to you know put time and money into. But a lot of times, maybe like, let's get out there and talk to the community and see what the real gaps actually are. So um, it's been a really, really great project um, being able to work with the like Foothills Municipal Association has been really, really great. Um, we've seen a lot of more uptake on our community care planning network table. 
uh, and having representation from all the municipalities participating at that table as well, uh, which is the leadership table for this community safety well-being project, as well uh, as well as the Ontario Health Team Development. So uh, we're seeing a lot of synergies right now between Ontario Health Team Development and the community safety well-being plan. A lot of the projects are sort of weaving in and out of each other, um, which definitely does hold well uh, for us and our communities. Are, through the Flosh are well positioned uh, and are sort of a step ahead of many of the other communities that we're going to be collaborating with once this Ontario Health Team um, sort of is approved and we are expecting that any day. I just wanted to say too, I find like the community members, the, the reaching out and actually giving feedback has been pretty amazing. I wasn't expecting as much feedback and I'm getting a lot more than I expected and Massey has been like pretty good at reaching out which was great. It was they're very interactive. So this is great community to like start these projects in and have this much community involvement and just seeing how many people show up here today is pretty amazing compared to other council meetings I have been to. That's nice to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's continue our work at the Colossian Foothills. Absolutely. Um, and you're right. It's we got to reach out to the public. That's, yeah. that's the key. It is. Because uh, they really don't know what we offer in terms of uh, you know, social services. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. Also, later in the year, uh, Donna Stewart from District Services Board will be coming to council to make a presentation to us to inform everybody of what they offer and what we can take advantage of. I'd like to bring Sudbury Public Health in as well to uh, address those things. Yeah, it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Any okay. questions for John and Jennifer? Jen, you mentioned about prevention. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what is the focus on prevention and what prevention program are we having? So every program that we're doing, we're trying to aim it at prevention of crime and any OPP okay. calls. Okay. So all of this, like with the mental health and addictions, this is all trying to prevent it. The safe handoff with OP is trying to prevent reoffending. We're working on another project that will try to prevent reoffending as well. Like, okay. and the the service mapping and the asset mapping and making an app with the red book for the OPP officers to use helps them direct calls rather than just arresting people, or it helps them keep people out of prison or jail. It, that's what our risk prevention is and trying to even providing services like DSAB so people have food and it's just preventing stress off people and mental health issues that will help like put a less weight on eMERGE, less weight on the OPP, mm -hmm. everything, all these little things really do add up and and help with those major issues. So just like in the just uh, a lot of the deliverables that are back to the to the, to the funder for this, uh, it does flow through OPP. Uh, so you will see that there is a, a, a fairly large focus on on policing and police services because uh, that's essentially where where the funding is is flowing through. They were they were the ones that had the grant application initially. Perfect. Thanks, John. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions mm -hmm. from anyone? Thank you, John and Jennifer. I'll see you Monday morning. Yeah. See you Monday morning. <laughs> 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 Okay. Be it resolved that we thank uh, Jennifer Legrander and John Bernetti for attending this meeting to provide an update on the community safety and well-being plan. We have a mover. Uh, Councillor Fairburn, second. Councillor Hobbs, all in favor? Very. <laughs> all right, we have another delegation. Oh, no, it's uh, no. no. You didn't get my No. Sorry, they didn't. Uh, they can't attend today. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on. Uh, um, so, Walford Agricultural Society. Okay. We received a request from uh, Mrs. Klug to uh, mm -hmm. waive the uh, fees for the rental of the Walford Hall for their 60th anniversary uh, flower show they're having in August. So instead of doing that, um, I've suggested maybe a $500 donation to the, the uh, society so that'll 
take care of their rental fees and any other incidentals they may have. Mm -hmm. Any questions on that? <laughs> we have resolved that we approve a donation to the Massey Walford Horticultural Society in the amount of $500, and that we extend our congratulations to them on the celebration of their 60th anniversary. We have a mover. <laughs> Councillor Hobbs, second Councillor Krabs, all in favor? It's carried. So, to give next item 2023 budget. That's that. To yeah. give notice that we're across the budget. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Be it resolved that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Sable Spanish River hereby gives notice of the intention to adopt the 2023 annual budget pursuant to Section 290 of the Municipal Act 2001. Uh, 25 at the regular meeting of April 26, 2023. Could I have a move? <laughs> Councillor Burns. <laughs> Second. Councillor Hobbs. Uh, all in favor? Gary. <laughs> So be it resolved that council adopt the compliance report for expenses excluded from the 2023 budget outlined in the treasurer's report dated March 22nd, 2023, as a requirement of Ontario Regulation 284-09 passed under the Municipal Act 2001. We have a motion. Councillor Krabs, second. Councillor Fairburn, all in favor? Carry. Be it resolved that the Finance Committee meeting report of March 13th, 2023 be accepted. We have a mover. Councillor Fairburn, second. Councillor Hobbs, all in favor? Carry. So I'll note that, so the next item is the uh, RFQ for organization and compensation review. I did get a second, we only received the one quotation. I did get a second late submission. And um, just so you know, the second one was $43,000. The one received was 24. Okay. So this is for reorganization of our Basically, some human resource uh, uh, wages and position within the township. Uh, it, it was suggested to me that a, a committee could be formed of citizens to govern this, and I beg to differ. It, it's classified, not classified, but it, it's confidential information. You're dealing with people's wages, people's uh, personal issues, people's benefits. It's not something for the public to deal with. So, be it resolved that we accept the request for proposal received from Keshi Associates for an organizational and a compensation review. Over. Uh, Councillor Krabs. Second, Councillor Hobbs, mm -hmm. all in favor? Yeah. Carry. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, Fire Chief's report. Any comments on the Fire Chief's report? None being heard. Be it resolved that the Fire Chief's report for the month of February 2023 be accepted as presented. Did I have a neighbor? Councillor Fairburn, second. Councillor Burns. All in favor? Carry. Okay, gravel tenders. Uh, be it resolved that the RFQ for the supply of granular materials for 2023 be awarded to James Latham Excavating Limited. Could I have a mover for that? Councillor Crabb, second. Councillor Fairburn, all in favor? Gary. So we were going to extend the deadline, but then we confirmed that the other company that they wouldn't be able to submit both until later in the year, right? right. Delivery next year. So right. Cambrian truck can get us a truck uh, late this year. And it's circulated the quote for on the second. Yeah, this, the yeah. second quote. Yeah, the, the, one, the only one that we received. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So be it resolved that the proposal from Cambrian Truck Center for a 2024 Western Star plow truck be accepted. Could I have a mover? Sure. Um, we just like to confirm that these, these numbers, like it, it, it's a little bit unclear to me the way the, the tender, the code is on that, the, the truck breakdown and the... So Jacques is here to oh, do is here. can clarify because he did speak. Stop, are you, are you in the back? Just, just to clarify, <laughs> just to clarify, not to criticize, just to clarify. The, the code is broke down in two sections. Yeah. And the one for the truck is doesn't have uh, uh, anything on it for the plow equipment. The one from Cambrian is a complete plow of the whole works. That is the complete, okay, okay, because it doesn't doesn't look that way. Yeah, all records went through it too, so I made a phone call to make sure we can stick. But it, it is in there, it's just not clear, but yeah, yeah. that's the complete plow of the truck. You basically bought everything through Cambria mm -hmm. as a package. But what we've done is asked for our package from Jim mm -hmm. uh, We went to Jim to get what we wanted to put on this truck through Cambria. So that's that's a complete truck. Okay, that's an event. The, the price is fair. Yeah. It's reasonable. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you. So can I have a motion for this? He doesn't know my name. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Burns. Second. Sure. Councillor Crab. All in favor? Gary. Uh, the validation of title. Uh, this this is another uh, council did an approval. Um, maybe this the last council. Uh, this lot was uh, created through consent, and the Planning Act statements were uh, not properly indicated on the transfer. So now the solicitor is asking for validation of the um, the process. And so I've got a motion for council to approve it. Be it resolved that council approves the validation certificate for property described as lot 12. Plan 53M-1161 together with Part 4, Plan 53R-19464, Caldwell Street, Massey. Could I have a motion? Councillor Fairburn, second. Councillor Hobbs, all in favor? Yep. Very. Okay, so discussion on the trailer trailer licensing bylaw zoning bylaw amendment. Okay. 
Any comments from council? We're still in the process of discussing it. And then we are. Okay. We are. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm listening to to council here. Okay. So, I mean, first, I'd like to ask, uh, and, and like last, uh, I don't know if you have the numbers yet, but a couple of weeks ago, I asked what our consulting yes. fees were so far. So, in 2022, we spent six dollars in consulting for this specific uh, uh, topic. I don't have 23 yet. Okay. So, as we discussed last time, I'm not in favor of imposing an additional fee. I know I'm hearing the, the term thrown out there, fair share. So, you know, help me understand when we're talking about assessing property taxes, and correct me if I'm wrong, so MPAC goes around, looks at properties, and assigns a dollar value based on what a share or a fair um, value is, is our current time here, right? Market fair market value, value fair yeah. market value. Mm -hmm. Then it comes back to here, and we assign a mill rate, I would assume, to that, right. to uh, assign a mm -hmm. fair share of your taxes. But I keep hearing that people living on these properties, if they bring in an RV trailer, all of a sudden aren't paying their fair share, and then we want to impose a fee on them. Now, I spoke with a few property owners, and some that called out ahead, and uh, they're not imposed against <clears throat> vacant trailers being adjacent to their lots, and some of these people live in, like I said, a half a million dollar homes, and their only concern is they don't want to look out and look at a pop-up trailer park. So there's a couple of cases where somebody owns property, and they're leasing it out, to four trailers at six hundred dollars a month, that needs to be dealt with. But I don't think we need to impose this fee on other people who are having a trailer and they're seasonal. They're there for a couple months of the year. They're respecting the rules, respectful to their neighbors. And then we, you know, last time we estimated probably about a hundred trailers in our community. That's a hundred families potentially coming out in the summer, spending money in our community. So, you know, we've already, we're, if you look at it, we're kind of losing money in our community already. You think about we've lost our bank, we lost Service Ontario. I remember having a discussion years ago with Murray Dunlop, who provided service here years, and he says, you know, when you lose the service in town, and at the time we had lost one grocery store, we were losing another one, was a teetering. If people go to Espanola, now to bank, do you think they're going to Espanola to take their money and come back to Massey, Webwood, and Walford to spend it? Probably not. They're going to go down there. They're going to get a haircut there, he says. They're going to buy groceries. They're going to go to the mall. They're going to go to the hardware store, Canadian Tire. That's pulling money out of here. So instead of encouraging people spending money here, we're going to impose pretty hefty fees for people to come down to enjoy their summer getaway. We keep talking about mental health. We talked about mental health tonight with John and Jen tonight. There's ecotherapy is a big thing right now where people go out into their quiet comfortable nature spots and it decreases anxiety depression yeah, i agree but we agree with it but we're saying well we need to impose a the fee on you for to stay there the problem is when you're paying taxes on vacant land you're not paying for upkeep of infrastructure you're not paying for police for services you're not paying for fire services Okay. It's vacant land. Did you say police services as well? Sorry. Okay. So I called OPP and we discussed this the last time. Yeah. And when I talked to the administrator mm -hmm. there, it was a perfect person to talk to because she had vacant land herself. Yeah. So I asked, if you have vacant land, are we entitled to call OPP? And she said, absolutely. She said, if I go buy my vacant property and somebody's squatting on that piece of property, you can call OPP to come down. And it's not an additional cost to the township and it's not a cost to that person that owns that property. Yes, I understand that. But what you're missing is somebody who's paying who's paying taxes on a home. Yes. A, a big portion of those taxes are, are paying for police services. And when all you're paying for is vacant land, how much of a share of the police services or the fire services are you paying? Well, just look at that. Some people are paying $1,800 a year for a vacant lot. Yeah. Some people pay 1400 more, and I would challenge anybody here to say that it's still based on vacant land. Really. But still, you're paying $1,800 a year for what kind of service are you getting, right? People in their homes, some of them are paying a lot less than $1,800 a year. It depends on your location and the value of your home. Correct. Absolutely. But what I'm saying is that a vacant lot owner could be paying $1,800 a year. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. A homeowner, depending on the value of your home, could be... $800 a year. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do we determine this fair share? 
the way for me, the way I look at the way the property taxes are assessed, there's only one person in the entire community that can say they're paying their fair share. If you look at the highest dollar value assessment on a property. So for example, let's say I have 160 acres. I have a house. I'm going to build a tiny home. So it's worth hundred thousand yeah. dollars. My neighbor, the adjacent property, 160 acres, builds a $600,000 home. Same grader goes by, same plow truck, same garbage truck. Yeah. My neighbor comes to me and says, Mike, you're not paying your fair share. You get the same service as me and you're paying a third of what I pay in taxes. Is that a fair assessment to say that? Or do I tell him you're paying too much for service? No, it's based on the value of your home and, and, and the equity you want to put into your home. Correct. But a vacant piece of land by the water is worth a lot of money. And we yeah. keep saying they're not paying their fair share. So now this person, $1,800 a year, could be paying, what, $24, $25, $2,600 a year now to go to their property. They're not tapping into any of our services. They're not hooked on water services. They're not. And, and again, over the last year, there was one fire call. And that wasn't even to a vacant piece of property. And also, speaking with that, if I have a vacant piece of land right now, I'm paying my fair share. I don't have a trailer on it. If I put a trailer on it, how does that suddenly cost the township money where I have to pay $700 to go on that piece of property? You're coming and going on a regular basis from your property. If 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 your trailer burns, you're going to let it burn? No, I'll call a fire department. Yeah, that's right. But you're entitled to that because if I have a vacant it's piece of land, not okay. vacant land, so what if somebody goes up to my vacant land, my property now, there's nothing, they squat and they start a fire and there's a brush fire. Do I just let it go or do I call the fire department? Well, that's that's crime. That's something. Yeah. But still, do I call the fire department? Who's going to respond? You do. Yeah. You call the fire department. Yeah. But you're not paying your fair share on vacant land. Yeah. Well, yeah. if the trailer's yeah. on the road, and it, and it catches fire. And it's on the road. But it's still plated in, under the MPO. <laughs> well, the, the MPO has nothing to do with the, the MPO has nothing to do with the trailer being parked on the Anything plate. plated and insured? Yeah. That is mobile. It's classified Ministry of Transportation. Yeah. Your trailer insurance will cover the cost of the fire service. Okay. I have a little question you mentioned. Like, Excuse me, it's not a public meeting. Oh, okay. It's a meeting of council. You're here to witness. Okay. We, we had our public consultation. If everybody starts getting in on this, it was public. no, it's not. So I think we all did. But that gentleman's right. Absolutely. We need a public meeting. Last meeting. We had a public meeting last year on this. We had quite a turnout. July, and yeah, nothing was yeah. resolved. Well, it's getting resolved. So we're here tonight. Councillor Burns asked last meeting for another forum because he couldn't even hear the last one. It said there was no answer, yes or no, that we could have it. Okay. So you're classifying the Nobody's yes. even read this new proposed bylaw. We don't well, so the first the first and second yeah. reading will be passed tonight, and the bylaw will be left for the public to read on the website mm -hmm. and yeah. here if anybody wishes to read it. And at the next council meeting, the third and final reading will be held. And the bylaw passed. We're, we're not listening to any more. You have to want to hear. We have to say. What we have, we have, we have, we pay taxes here. We have something to say too. Well, How many then why did trailers? nobody our, our listen? Listen, this here. isn't a public meeting. Okay, it's a I'm meeting of council. No, you're out of order. You're out of order. It's a it's it's a meeting of council. It's not a public consultation. If you wanted to speak before council, you were to call the clerk and present yourself as a delegation. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna listen to questions from everybody in the crowd. This isn't what the meeting's for. It's not a question, it's facts. Well, it, it doesn't matter. Right so can I just say something like at our last meeting? We're talking about you have to be on the agenda. I'm looking at the March 8th agenda right now. It doesn't say any, any delegations. However, we invited someone in the audience to speak, and that was Miss Kluge. She had the opportunity to speak at the last. Yeah. Yeah, she wasn't now I'm, I'm having people pop up, and 
There's quite a few people here. Correct. We're going to lose this. But we heard her out, yeah, right? We heard that. that lady out, and she was not on the agenda for as a delegate to speak. Council Grab. Yes. Um, okay. We're going to we're going to uh, do the first and second reading, yes. which means that second reading is as we've looked at. It's up for discussion. Yeah. We're not going to do the third reading, but that's there's a time frame there so the ratepayers can come and have a look at this. Two weeks. Two weeks. Now, in this two week period. Um, uh, if they were to have a delegate concerned with this yeah. and had a delegation and come back to council, exactly, and that's how you do that. Then the third reading won't be read until your concerns are taken into consideration. But that would be the the business way to do it. So you'll you'll see this. It'll it'll come out. You'll see the draft um, or the proposal first and second. Um, if you have an is issue with it. Uh, set up a delegation, have that delegation be present at the next meeting, as long as you're there the Friday before the meeting, have it on, then this will be discussed before the third reading is ever done. And it may be deferred because there's concerns that are, are, are legitimate, but this is the, the business way to do it. Yeah. Councilor Burns. Thank you. Uh, I talked to one rate right payer this week and he's in and he said, Years before, they were permitted to have their trailers on their lots, and it only changed when this official plan became official. So the official plan became official on May 28, 2020. So I don't know what's going on, but I would like to see the official, I would like to see the official plan that this one replaced and right. see if they had if they had if they had the right to have trailers on vacant lots and this plan took it away and now we want to charge them five hundred dollars to get it back they already had it the plan didn't take it away the bylaw was enforced the, the bylaw was enforced before that so can i ask a question yeah can i ask of the member of that uh, i was talking to to stand up and speak I'll allow it. Bobby? Okay. So in 2010, I bought a lot. I come to the council meeting, they were bringing that by the in. I said, is this going to affect the private owner? No. It's the words out of their mouth. I got brought in, come back, inspect everything I did there. Good. So now I'm in violation of court this. I, I don't know what happened in 2010, mm -hmm. Bob. I well, I mean, you're putting, you're putting enforcing stuff told you back then to now. Right? There's nothing for grandfathering in this bylaw. Oh, I got the bylaw. Which bylaw are you showing? The new one you're showing. You're, yeah. you're talking no, there is no grandfather. No. no. Why not? Because we have to treat everybody equally. So you're outlawing people that have been abiding by the law until this point? No, you, you, haven't been been abiding, yeah. you haven't been abiding by the law because it's against the law to have a trailer on vacant land. It wasn't. It wasn't back then. Well, back then. Well, I wasn't here when the, the original well, well, bylaw was passed. Come in here and now, it. see, everybody's chiming in again. It's not a public I meeting. Didn't. I'll she shut this down. Guys, if, 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 we, if we could just speak one at a time. Councillor Hobbs. That. Can I speak, right. please? Councillor Hobbs. Thank you. Prior to amalgamation, the township zoning bylaw official plan did not allow trailers on vacant land. The second one, yes. And that was because, prior, excuse me, excuse me, prior to amalgamation. The, the, yeah. So, um, yeah, so prior to, to 2016 or 2010, when you were talking about coming in, um, yeah, it, it, they weren't allowed on vacant land. You weren't allowed to bring it down to waterfront property and just pop it there. That was in violation of zoning bylaw at that time. So you're saying so. Change. So Councillor Fairburn. I'm sorry. That was uh, prior to amalgamation, which was I didn't know the year. 98. 98. 98. So yeah. since 1998, if it has never been allowed, we've just been doing it, right? Like that paperwork wise. I mean, like it's we've never been allowed. That people have been we've we've never enforced. It's, it's never, never been, been enforced, enforced by. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So 
My uh, concern too is if you take, you know, if I could speak on Bobby's half, you have for one second. So Bob Mayhew has a vacant piece of land. He has a trailer on it. He has a pretty expensive home he's paying high taxes on. He has a commercial business he's paying high taxes on. Now we're going to hit him again for another round of fees to go out by the lake for a couple weekends of the year, a week maybe. That's pretty high rate. You know what I mean? It's like and we, we have nothing to show so far that, holy cow, if we look at it, boy, these, these trailers are costing us all kinds of money with fire calls, police calls, service calls, EMS. We have none of that to document that. We keep talking about fair share. Nobody can give me an accurate number on what fair share is, but we seem to come up with a, a number of seven. Well, if we impose $700, now that's a fair share. So if we have two vacant lots, one's $1,200, one's $1,800, they're both going to pay $700 a year when one's paying more taxes than the other. You know what I mean? Like, and you, and you may kind of... But, but that's apples you, and you, oranges. Well, no, it's not apples and oranges because it it's people's finances. I know People are struggling. I and we recognize that. I but we're going to impose more money. And what are they getting in return for that $700 a year? They're going to pay their share of the infrastructure and the police services and the fire services. Well, I beg to differ because well, I what, what I'm saying is that they're paying $700. That's $70,000 we're going to collect out of 100 trailers. And they may never call the police. They may never ask for fire services. They may never tap into any services. That's a pretty hefty hit. It's a pretty hefty hit. So, and you think so, that so tell me this. We want growth in our community. Yes, we do. How are we going to have growth if every vacant lot gets filled with a trailer? Okay. You know, what kind of incentive is there going to be to build a home there. Okay. So do you think, for example, someone like Mr. Mayu has a house? Is he going to build a house there again? So he's, a, He's and one it, example. Okay. Well, maybe you should talk to all those property we, owners. We have to treat everybody fairly. Yes. We have to treat everybody the same way. We can't say, well, it's no, too well, bad. No. Bob's I, paying a lot. No, of I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Not. But there's probably people within our township that have a vacant piece of land, like myself. I'm paying high enough taxes on my yeah, property, so and I can't even go and put a trailer if I want on my vacant land. There's other people who live in Sudbury or southern Ontario. Do you think they're going to come down here and build a house when they're welcome like this with slapped with extra money? They might come down and say, you know what, this is a pretty welcoming community. It's reasonable. They're not following suit with everybody else with their hands out saying you've got to pay five, six, seven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 a year oh. to go to your property. There is some there are $1,200 a year. We never spoke about it. I'm not saying that, but there are some communities. And if you look at the bylaws and do the research, and I've looked, some are charging $1,200 a year. $100 a month. Um, I did receive messages too from people that were property owners and had their own trailers on their own property and they felt um, comfortable with paying some sort of licensing fee. They felt comfortable with that. Um, they pointed out, you know, the, the garbage pickup, the recycling pickup, and they can understand that cost of not everybody's at their trailer every day and, and so forth, but that there would be some costs associated with that. Um, I know myself, just like on Agnew Lake Road, there was trailers that put their garbage and recycling out that were not paying any any contribution to that expense, which I know we only say it's 100 trailers or 200 trailers, but it does create like, extra garbage stops along the roads and stuff like that. They were fine with um, contributing something. I think the dollar value, like you said, is a is a big point and i understand uh, myself as a rate payer too that that's something but i thought we had also discussed it not being that amount like i did i well, like what seven, amount? Any story? seven i thought we had seven i thought well, that was all well, yeah i thought we had dropped it down to five and then well, we talked about yeah. year one being a much lower I, I just I don't know that like off the top of my head the exact numbers but i think maybe that is something that would be an opportunity at the next meeting, if there's delegates to bring up numbers that they're comfortable with, it's something like if it, I, and I get the financial strain, I understand that completely. You know, I'm a property owner, homeowner, single person with overhead. So I understand what you're saying, but I also, and um, I mean, we talk about the resources, but I think like with banking and stuff, when you brought up that point, a lot of people are on automatic deposit and, and they pay debit and stuff. So, I, I, you know, like a lot of people do that. 
So I'm hoping that because we live here, I don't go to the bank ever. <laughs> Barely ever. I use my debit card. Everything's direct deposit. I do make a point of purchasing in my community. I come to Massey to do shopping, you know, to get my hair done, stuff like that um, as well. And so I don't know if that's like a major impact that we have to really panic about. I think our people are conscientious. I have to go to town, but I think if you shop here, you shop here too. I don't, I, I would hope that our residents do come back to and shop here. Like, you know, cause Clover Farms is nice to have. And I'm always at the Rona and I'm always at the home hardware. Um, but I think with the trailer, I think if the fee is a huge thing and I think, it, you know, I'm seeing a lot of head nodding as we're talking that I hope that people will come to the next one with a dollar value that they do think fair. If they think overall subjectivity of, of like that thing of 200 extra stops for our garbage truck is going to have an impact. It, it you know, it's also tonnage and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying I know the dollar value of what everything costs, but there is some impacts, but I think we want to make it attractive because you're right. People that have a property, I think I used you as my example too, is because this bylaw, it's just the beginning. It's just the rough draft of starting something because we have people with property that want to be on it and, and should so be on it. But we also want to make sure there isn't a, a chaos created. And I had asked to, to clarify was like, okay, if Mike's my brother and he owns property and I have a trailer and he lets me put it on it, who gets in trouble if there's an infraction? It turned out it would be Mike yeah. <laughs> and not me, even though it's my trailer. So we always think of, oh, well, I have property and I'll let a friend go on it. Like this is also to protect the property person. So I just would hope that everybody that's here thinks like this is just a starting point, a scratching point, and we can only brainstorm so much. And I think, you know, we brainstormed it and come up with a lot of good points, but we do put it out. That's why it's not being finalized. It goes out and, and people can have a chance to review it and go, oh, you missed this or you thought of this because we're here, but it is only so many brains that can pick something apart and you always won't see it until it comes up so I just wanted to, to let people know that you know like that it's not a, a done deal but we need that input but you have to start somewhere and we had heard both sides and I mean it might just be a different thing about the fee structure or longevity of fee structures or reduction as time goes by like we got to start somewhere okay just wanted to point out that uh, one of the other things that this bylaw is trying to deal with is um, how people are handling their uh, gray water and their sewage. Um, because especially waterfront, uh, we, we want to make sure that it's all being properly taken care of so that we don't have the um, rainwater, whatever, flowing and bring it all into uh, the lakes. Um, when I was working uh, in Huntsville, one of the lakes that we uh, was in our um, municipality, it was at its sort of capacity. And we did uh, a study on the water quality and the number of um, septics that were leaking and the sewage coming down from properties that did have trailers on them. So, you know, that this bylaw sort of addresses that because you have to say, I've got this in place. I've got the gray water pit built. I'm dealing with the, the sewage with a privy, whatever. Um, so I just wanted to point out that that's one of the aspects covered with this. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that we have one time to get this right. So let's take our time and do it right. I think we should have another meeting so if their concerns are met, us as four new counselors get to ask questions and hear the answers to our questions instead of going on YouTube and listening to a green and watching a grainy film and not hearing anything. I need quiet, like we do now. We don't need people yelling. We just want to talk. We just, we're all adults here. We'll talk through. 
but we need to have another meeting because as it is right now, I will not support this. So, Marianne, I agree about the suit and stuff, and I yeah. did call Sudbury District Public Health after there was any complaints of improperly disposed yeah. of sewage by any, not a single complaint yeah. on file. Yeah. So, what we're trying mm -hmm. to do here is <clears throat> we're reacting to a problem that doesn't exist right now. And even with what, yeah. well, well, then <laughs> be otherwise, if, if you call Sudbury yeah. Public Health and they're saying they don't have any record. And now, another thing, too, yeah. I'd like to know how many of these old homes <clears throat> that may be along a river or a lake. Are their septic systems working well? Are they yeah. within the recommended limits away from that? So what do we do? We're going to punish the RV owners for sewage. Meanwhile, their neighbor could have a field bed that's not working well or too close to the lake or river. Are we going to go after them and say, hey, wait a minute, your field bed's not working quite right or you're too close now. Is that what we're going to do? What, what I'd like to do here, and I'm, I agree with Cass, we need to delay this. And we need to, we need to look at this and just have some control right one trailer on one lot owned by the owner and perhaps maybe an occasional person traveling through the summer family member stay there a week or two and then mosey on one trailer on a lot by an owner stays on there we need to enforce that we don't want pop-up trailer parks i don't want that next to my house either and i agree with that you have a beautiful home these people that called me take great pride and ownership in their house they don't want that next door we can put a bylaw to say one trailer, one occasional trailer, one small shed, not a bunch of sheds, one shed to keep your supplies in there, correct? So I'd like to defer this, and if it becomes a problem in the future where it is costing taxpayers for services because of RV owners, then we need to look at imposing it. Then it's justified. Right now to say, I want $700 a year, you may or may not benefit from that. You know, when somebody demands money out of you and you get nothing in return, I don't know what the term for that is, but I'm not, I don't want somebody taking my money and giving me nothing in return. People could be paying for 20 years owning that property and never get a nickel of that. So either refund it back to them or to say, look, until it becomes a problem, why do we need to react with it by charging people? Yeah, I think the, the whole introduction of this bylaw, you got to go back and we were not council as previous us, but if you, if you do a bit of research on it, you can see that there were issues. And this is the reason why this has come up. It, it, it just didn't come up as a, a way to it was not pick up money some money, grab. not a money grab. It's because there were environmental issues and safety issues and how, and there was no bylaw whatsoever to act on anything. So now the previous council, they went ahead and, and they've done some homework on it and uh, we've adopted it. But what we really need to do is, is just look at this big picture. Just before you continue, there was a bylaw. Mm -hmm. It was a bylaw that said you were not allowed a recreational yeah. vehicle on vacant land. Yeah, that, that's okay. yeah, that's that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah. So we need they then decide. Okay, they may, they decide this this needs to change. It. So now we need to look at it and find out how to resolve these issues. So the issues that came up a year or two ago don't happen again. And somebody's got to pay for this. And I don't think that I've talked to people that are about the uh, about the trailer and they don't they don't think they don't mind from what I've got is. They all know that, uh, and they all respect this, and they know that things have to be governed to a certain point. But it all it does cost money, so it's just to come up with that that number and, and the service that's going to be given for this. Yeah. That's what we need to look into. Councilor Macheka, I, I agree with you, Councilor Crabs. Absolutely, like if people are improperly dumping sewage, whatever, yeah, they need to be. That needs to be enforced, right? That is an issue or a potential issue. But what we need to do is go on a complaint basis, right? So if all of us here, we have a trailer and I'm dumping sewage. Why do you guys have to be penalized for, for my error to assume that, you know, everyone around here all of a sudden can be improperly disposing of gray water and sewage? That's not how it works outside of... But you're not being penalized. Well, if you're not you're, you're paying so that there will be control and that everybody will be doing it properly. Right. And, and you know, have a nominal fee when somebody comes out and says, hey, look, I own this land. And then, you know, and to my knowledge, you never need to call a building official to come in and set up an RV trailer, correct? 
No. No. So I don't want to be paying for someone to come out and inspect that. And, you know, I will, I will sign whatever it, the bylaw states, you know, you have to show your property disposing your gray water, your sewage, et cetera. And that's easily rectified. These RV homes come with tanks that hold this. They can be pumped out. Yeah, they don't. And nobody's there. nobody's going to go to their summer property and dump their sewage. Let's no. face it. There's no, no way. No, no. Nobody does that. Councilor Correa. Well, I think I, I bear to differ a little bit with you. I think, I think this was part of the problem. Some of the problem in the past is the, because I've had RVs of it, well, every aspect of them, and. Uh, if you're going to sit on a spot for we allow 21 days yeah. well if you're going to be there for 21 days uh you had to dump this two or three times somewhere yeah. yeah so what this what this permit does or what this i'm going to call legislation does it it shows that you have to prove that you have a place to do this rather than you're just kind of word you know i'll just wing it now if you set your trailer up and you if you get the permit or whatever um, the inspector says okay here here is a gray water pit you have to do you're going to fall and you're and you're a lot more apt to do that sure. where if somebody just comes in and if there is no regulation whatsoever well it's maybe a bit of gray yeah literally yeah and then you know something public health and i talked to them too you could build a pit privy there's no yeah. permit be it has to be yeah. inspected mm -hmm. so i i agree with that we need to take the environment into consideration right but this all you're setting fun. it up for sure, and they should pay for that. But you're not going to pay for that year after year after mm -hmm. year. Seven hundred dollars. We talked about seven hundred dollars, and we said five hundred if you buy it before a certain time. Yeah. Right. So seven hundred bucks a year on top of your property taxes. Mm -hmm. And again, what are they getting for eighteen hundred dollars a year? A grader goes by, a plow goes by. They can't even stay there. What's the purpose of having the property? And you pay school taxes on it too, right? On top of that as well. And you are paying your fair share because that's how the system works. You're assessed on the uh, fair market value and we charge the mill rate. We determine what we need yeah, but from these property owners include, to run that. doesn't include the value of a home. And right. that RV right. is your home while you're there. And it's not a home because it can't be classified as a home. <laughs> So why do you think all these people go to like why do you think people have that instead of building it you know? because they have another house they have a home don't tell me they live here all year oh, round if they're living there all year round then we got a problem right and then you enforce the bylaws and you can't live in there all year round they have a home i'm not going to build a, a house another house to go to my vacant piece of property that's a mile down the road Councilor fair so again i think it is all circled back again to the price pointing issue and I think that's something that's bearable and can be can be discussed. But I I, I just want to reiterate that I think it does need to be discussed more, Absolutely. and it needs to be the feedback from people, both trailer owners and and I don't know anti trailer people. I don't the know other the other side the other point. side of the coin, um, because I think right now because we have nothing at all, we have no protection for anybody. No. Like the people that set it up really well, like you're the ones that have to say where, you know, because we use the word common sense too freely and there's a lot of people without it. So if you've got a really good setup, maybe your setup is the example that the bylaw can be built on because right now we have nothing and we have a problem with pop-up trailers being lived in right now by people where the police have to go and they're pounding on the door saying you can't live in this trailer in this train parking lot and there's no feedback and there is no outhouse and there is no drainage so it is happening whether those reports formally go through public health or not i've witnessed it with my own eyeballs <laughs> like my my sister-in-law has witnessed it with her own eyes and people don't want to make waves and you don't want to fight with your neighbors and you don't want to get people angry at you and you want to enjoy the nature. And I think there's lots of points to put in that. I don't own vacant property, but my family does. There maybe there has to be an amendment that, you know, Edie can put her trailer on that, or there's some sort of waiver. Like there's so much to it, but right now we have nothing. So as a trailer person, there's no teeth that you don't have any teeth to get rid of the chaos trailers that are making camping look bad. Like right now we have, because we have nothing. So I think like if 
we had like Bobby set up on a schematic or whoever's on water on a schematic. Maybe you already knew you have to be 30 feet back from the water. But I know a lot of people that will just park really close. <laughs> like, and so we have nothing. So I think like it, it's just an opportunity to have that further discussion. And if you are wanting to be a delegate to come is to come and give us some of the concrete stuff. Like, yeah, my trailer set back 30, mine's 40, mine's this, we do this, we do that. So that we have something to help our community because we want people camping. We want people coming here, but because we have nothing and to let go of like, this is how it was 30 years ago, 20 years ago. Well, this is how it is today. So what can we do today? to make it work for everybody and to have it work well for, cause we want success, you know, like I think at the end of the day, everybody on council wants success for everybody. And if it's coming down to a dollar value, well, that's a really, like, that's something we can work out to have a successful trade off, to have a bylaw that protects our environment, our people that own, like you said, like you have a beautiful home. You got to remember there's all those things about, you have to keep your grass cut. Well, you know, we have nothing in place. <laughs> we have it in place if you have a home. So it gives you opportunity to do those little things like where do you store your fire? Like there's so many elements of it. But right now, because we have nothing, we can't, we have to start somewhere, I guess is what I'm saying. Can I speak to this just for one moment? It's just a quick comment. As a realtor in the area for the last 12 years, I can say without a doubt that people from out of our community buy these land on water with a trailer. Go more than willing to take for permits for gray water pits for whatever because they want to get to know the community before they come in five years, ten years when they're ready to retire to build a six hundred thousand dollar home. So if by pushing them away, we're not doing anything for our future revenue. And I think it's just good business to look at all of the aspects of this because there are a few people that are going to use it. That's inevitable, but we got to make it so that it's acceptable for the majority and inviting. So, <laughs> so we've had plenty of discussion with council here on this for now. Uh, we're going to go ahead and look for a motion to pass this the first and second time, but I will tell you that we will put a motion to schedule a public consultation before we pass the third and final motion. Fair enough. So could I have a motion? Be it resolved that the following bylaws be read a first and second time. Bylaw 2023-13 being a bylaw to amend the zoning bylaw 2003-15 and bylaw 2023-14 being a bylaw to license recreational vehicles in the township from Sable Spanish River. Can we ask this to be a recorded vote? We can. Recorded vote, please. Yeah. Okay. This is leading to excuse me. This is leading to public meetings. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. First and second motion. Yep. If if, if it if the first and second read. If it, if it doesn't pass the third and final reading, yeah. then it doesn't fly. Yeah. Okay. okay. So could I have a could I have a mover, Councillor Krabs? Could I have a second, Councillor Fairburn? Uh, Ken, can I ask a question there? You're you're passing the motion. It's it's and Kevin. You, and it's you Kevin. don't even have uh, a a to put a motion on. You don't know what your your bylaw is itself, do you? Yes, we do. We have a written bylaw ready to go. You didn't know how much it's going to cost or anything. No, no, no. no. Council, yeah. Councillor Fairburn said that that was up for discussion, but we do have a bylaw. We do have a bylaw written, ready to go. And, and we could have passed it all tonight, but we're gonna give the public an opportunity to review it. And we're gonna have a public consultation again uh, for the sake of the four councillors that were not here when we did it last time. What's that? The bylaw will be available for anybody to look at. So where where do we get it? Right here. It'll be posted on the township website as well. So sorry, Kevin Mervinerick. So this motion is to discuss. to discuss further. This yes. is not passed. Okay. This is, this is, okay. Yep. Perfect. The yep. bylaw be read a first and second time. <laughs> 
it needs to be done a third and final time yep. in order to be and we'll have public yes. consult yes and we'll have a public consultation in between so could I have a motion councillor crab is your second councillor hobbs uh recorded vote councillor burns i'm in favor as long as there's public consultation councillor crabs yes i'm in favor of the councillor fairburn discussion Councillor Hobbs. Yes. Councillor Marcheka. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. And I won't call you Tim. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm in favor, given that we are open to discussion again. Mm -hmm. with, uh, yes. with the that's, that's, uh, I said it. Yeah. No, that's good. Happen. Yeah. Okay. We'll, Thank you. We'll that. have another motion uh, at the next meeting. For good. That. So motion carry. We find some middle ground. Uh, one other thing, if anybody would like to provide uh, uh, township staff with their email address, we'll be happy to email a copy of the bylaw. But it will also be available on the township website. Excuse me, guys, in the, in the back, uh, the mayor was speaking. Could you just keep it down to a dull roar? And just respect speaking, please. Thank you. Thanks. Did everybody hear what I said? No. Anybody that would like a, an electronic copy, uh, township staff would be happy to send you one if you provide an email. If not, it'll also be on the township website. And a, a copy will be here, a paper copy if you'd like one as well. So moving on, uh, short-term rentals. So I brought this just for council to start considering. It is it's coincidental. I did receive a, a mail, an email from another clerk who's polling other municipalities to see um, if they're looking at it because they are, it, it's a matter of being proactive rather than reactive. Yeah. So this becomes uh, a tool to promote our area as a safe place to come and rent. You know that uh, these people are registered. Um, there's a lot to go through and I, and I think just for now, I just want council to sort of start looking at it, reviewing. That's just one um, bylaw sample that was North Bruce Peninsula who did Quite an extensive review and have consultants in to come and, and draft something because they become overrun with people and it became a real problem it, it, it uh, weighed heavily on their infrastructure their their garbage their parking it just trampled the whole area so they had to do something um i've seen a couple other places blue mountains is doing something and um there's another municipality that's looking at doing these short-term rentals uh, licensing bylaw rather than putting it as part of your zoning um, it's better to because people need to have um, to show that they've got adequate septic because a lot of older camps and if you're looking at the recreational places uh, maybe it can't support somebody coming and staying you know for those that whole summer whether it's different groups what's happening with the garbage is there adequate parking um fire safety do the people know where to go what to do who to contact if they have an emergency so all those things are are rolled into that bylaw and that's a very simplistic way of putting it but um, that's what it will address so really tonight it's just for council to start looking at and i'll be bringing other samples and and uh, information forward in the coming uh, meetings Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, it was quite the document. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. There's a lot in it, but yeah. they have to. You have to look at everything because every eventuality, anything that could happen, right, and have a, a plan in place. People have to have insurance, so that you know that, and being registered, so someone could call the municipality and say, "Hey, you know, I I saw this Airbnb advertised. Is it legit?" And yeah. you can say, "Oh, yeah, they have a license, so you're good." You know that 
we know that the safety of the people renting um, will be there. So. Are they that's finding it's almost like the Airbnb, the pop up space? Yes. And that, yes. that, that's what this is really yes. addressing. Is there, is. is there a pop up yeah. Airbnb? People want to make use of their property that they're not here all the time mm -hmm. and it's sitting and they're paying taxes. So mm -hmm. why not generate some revenue? Right. That'd be good. And renters from. want to know that I'm not going to scary yes, place. Yes, exactly. It turns out more to a so. shipping container that they just rented for two okay. weeks. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, okay. uh, and and it's something we can market our area. Look at we we encourage our our people to have you know to do short term rentals. This is a good place to come and maybe boost our tourism, generate some cool. Mm -hmm. Some interesting. I, I think. Uh, I think some of the municipalities on the island have implemented yeah. this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's taken out. Yeah. Um, any, yeah. Uh, any other questions on this for now? I mean, it's a, like I said, it's a big document. It's a work in progress. So yeah. for reason, and it's a work in progress. It isn't that much different than trailer licensing, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, I imagine Manitoulin Island would have something. Yeah. Here. So tourism, B&B. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's a little different from a B&B. &B. A B &B, the people are living, but the owners are living on the property. Yeah, that's right. And this Air, is where you hear yeah. it is all to yourself, right? Yeah. So, and an Airbnb. Yeah. 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 All right, if there's no more discussion on that, uh, we'll move on to the next item, urban agriculture, backyard chickens. So, so I'll just give it some background. In 2014 and again in 2020, Council dealt with the issue of chickens being raised in town limits. They are not permitted, permitted in the residential zone, only in the rural zone where agricultural use is permitted. Both times council had listened and acknowledged the individual's desire to raise free range chickens in their backyard. However, the general consensus was that council did not agree to amend our planning documents to allow for this as it permitted use in the residential zones of our municipality. Council's concern was that if we did allow for this, However, limited or restricted, we still did not have the manpower resources to control and enforce the provisions. Uh, Councillor Mer Merchika asked uh, this to be revisited. So uh, we reached out to planning consultants to inquire on the process. To do this, we would take a two pronged approach. We would first have to amend the zoning bylaw to allow for this, then pass a regulatory bylaw, which would set out specific requirements with respect to location, number allowed, etc. If council wishes to pursue this, the first step would be to hold a public meeting to hear comments from the public before passing the zoning bylaw. Amendment. Planning Act regulations require notice of the meeting to be given not less than 20 days prior to the meeting. Once the zoning bylaw amendment is passed, there is a further 20 day appeal period. There are no appeals and council could pass a regulatory licensing bylaw to permit the raising of chickens in the residential zone of the municipality. And on that, uh, we'll have some comments. I would like to start by saying that the problem with having chickens in backyards in our urban municipalities, Webwood and Massey, first and foremost is public health issues. Everybody has groundwater in Webwood and that would be a dangerous thing. Massey has their own water, so it would not be the same concern. But again, with chickens have an increase in rodents. Uh, in southern Ontario right now, there, there actually there are municipalities that allow chickens and they're actually making people test them and some are being culled because of bird flu. The other issue is it's going to become a property standard nightmare because one neighbor is going to be complaining about the next neighbor having chickens 
who isn't keeping his place clean. We've got enough problems with property standards right now that we don't need any extra, honestly. Another, another issue will be noise. Uh, so those are my feelings on it. I was on council when this came around last time and I voted against it. Now I'll give the floor to the rest of the council to make their wishes heard. Mary Ann? <laughs> Gee, thanks. <sighs> okay. Um, I, okay, first off, I have to, to let you know that the people I have heard from, and that's on the phone, text, on the street, uh, from Massey, have been uh, opposed to, opposed to this. So I will make you aware that that's, and it's been about 14, 14 altogether. Um, I was sort of on the fence about it, um, except one time I thought, oh, you know, that'd be kind of neat to have chickens, you know. And then I thought, I thought about things and all the responsibilities that go with it, you know, like the cleaning and the everything else. And I know it's, it's not for me. Um, I did speak with again over on the island i spoke with the cao at a signac because i knew they had a bylaw there and they had run a pilot pro program for i think two years he said that the only complaint that they had was um chickens got on the loose and they weren't very great because they ran over to a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> so they got a call saying that we've got chickens here. And he was saying, oh, okay, well, I'll take one. I'm sure it's own cool too. But it was chickens running at large. But um, right now, I'm not okay with saying yes to it just based on the concerns that were voiced to me by residents. Councillor Burns? Uh, I burned up a little bit of data on the phone, checking on chickens, and I'll be honest, <laughs> I was thinking about getting chickens, and I live yeah. in the country. Yeah. So that I got pros for close. one second, Kaz. The thing is, there's a lot of room in our township where you can have chickens legally. Mm -hmm. You know, just not in Massey and not in Wickham. Go ahead, Council Burns. So anyway, I was thinking about getting chicken. <laughs> so anyway, I want to read you the pros that I found. They live a long time, 10 years for a land hen. Before that age, depending on the type of bird, yeah, but they they only lay to about four, age four, five, depending on what type you got. But they're going to live for 10, so they're going to outlive some of your other pets. And they can and will be treated as a pet, and they have a personality. They can be used for educational purposes. Kids love them. You're going to get eggs from them. That's a plus. And you get compost for the garden. That's the pros. The cons is a little different. The cons, everybody knows, because diseases associated with a chicken is bird flu, avian influenza, E. coli, salmonella bacteria, and this can't be low bacter, and that, that and that salmonella bacteria live in the intestines and are passed around in the bird droppings. So you're stepping in them everywhere. Poultry dust is a problem. That's a mixture of bedding material, droppings, feed, and dander, natural components that chickens live with. It's a major hazard in uh, large flocks, commercial, but still poses a concern, so cleaning is important and often. Nowhere in all the data I burnt did it say quantities. Didn't say 50 chickens, one chicken, 100,000 chickens. It just said chickens. So you can put whatever number you want on there. Uh, this uh, that's a major hazard. Uh, so cleaning is often, yeah, one guy said he actually vacuums his coop four to six times a year to get rid of this dust. The dust will cause coughing, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest tightness, sore throats, and flu-like symptoms. 
Then you got the space requirements for chicken. CDC, Center for Disease Control, recommends 50 feet from a well. No, no feces, no bacteria from feces can be that close, 50 feet. So how close to a house and how close to lot lines and then how big of a coop and a run. Then you got noise, waste management, odor, disease, rodents, or attraction. So you got the cost of the coop, runs, birds, annual permit. There's lots of these uh, townships down in the south that are allowing chickens are charging you so much for the coop. They're making you vaccinate your chickens every three months. You got four or five different vaccines. And uh, feed, the cost of feed, treats, and health care. They require daily maintenance to the coop in the yard. Some municipalities require authorization from all surrounding neighbors to, uh, to authorize poultry in the R1, R2 zones. It's just, you know, if you got permission from everybody, then they'll let you in. But I guess if somebody complains, then they're kicking you out. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I'm just reading what I found. What do you do with a dead chicken? What do you do to disease chicken? Yeah. Perhaps a necropsy? This is what I think, because I watch Lone Star Law. Right? We always <laughs> want to find out what killed that bird. <laughs> so if you're living beside some chickens and there's some diseases there, do you want to know if you're the flock owner? And do you want to know if you're the neighbor? So that guy's supposed to have four chickens, now he's only got two. Where are the other two? So I suggest a necropsy. We've got to find out what killed that bird. And that's just so you're not taking that chicken and throwing it over the Spanish River Bridge or throwing it in the ditch out of the Southern Sea. We got enough garbage out there. Thank you very much. We don't need a chicken. Uh, so testing is that. And some municipalities don't permit egg sales or meat sales without government inspection. So that's, you know. And then perhaps we need input from veterinarians and biologists before we proceed any further. So my answer is no. No chickens. But I did research it before I gave you the answer. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I appreciate, appreciate that. that. I like to do the research. Right? Yeah. You have to make an informed decision. I'm going to let Councillor Krabs go ahead and okay. Fairburn because I think I might be the only one in favor of this. So. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I want to address all your issues. I did some research. Well, I, I think as is, is dedicated counselors, we've all done some our homework. We've done here. Yeah, just. Councilor Burns is you know, excellent on that end. Um, I took a look at uh, permits from an area down southern Ontario. And if you looked at <clears throat> your chicken coop, has to be, now, in Tallahassee, everybody has a tile bed, septic system. You can't have your chip, chicken coop near your tile bed. It's got to be a distance away from it. The reason for this being, in the wintertime, it'll freeze it. So you've got to be so many meters from your tile bed. You have to be so many meters from your property line. So most of the, because I was in this business for 30 years, most of the people, when they put a tile bed in their yard, you went the minimum, you had to be 10 feet from your property lines where you started your tile bed, you had to be X number of feet from the house and et cetera, or from your garage, or if you had a swimming pool or whatever. If you, if you took all those distances, put them all together, and then according to these permits, you had to allow enough square footage for this chicken coop who has to have so many square foot per chicken and, and a run and such and such. A lot of the lots in town, for example, are like 50 by 100 or 50 by 120. In that 50 by 120, you have a driveway, you have a house, you have a garage, um, you might have a swimming pool, and your backyard but in your backyard you a lot of places you really had to look for an area to put this tile bed in so i don't i i, I say you know what if we did go ahead with this there'd be so few people that could actually follow through with this because when they do the measurements and they go to the health unit and they have to find out and find where all this is and come up with the that they're not going to be able to get the permit anyway but uh but so but it's gonna cost the thing is it's gonna cost a lot of money to get set up for that like we gotta we gotta hire it's only gonna be 20 people in town that have this and this cost is gonna be spread over every taxpayer in the municipality not just in the in the residential area because this bylaw is, is only about residential area 
is definitely as the order. But we know what would is out. We know why. So do the, do the rest of the rate payers want to pay for this? So I'm I know. Well, water. <laughs> <laughs> Counselor Fairbanks. Um, so I'm an animal lover. I'm an animal advocate. Um, I have written a pilot project on having backyard chickens uh, eight years ago, way before I was involved with the council, <laughs> um, just because it was my dream to have two chickens. Um, still don't have them. I live in Webwood. And I think my biggest thing was hearing, being told, no, I can't, <laughs> rather than at least have some sort of bylaw that gave me the information, which I think the other councils really provided, because you're right, it's all about the measurements, and I have a point system. So it's like, hey, how, where could I put them 50 feet away from my point? I'm on a double lot. I might be lucky. I'm on a double mm -hmm. lot. I don't know. I'd have to be out there with the measuring tape. My other thing is animal husbandry. Um, I hate seeing the dogs chained outside on six foot length, like that kind of stuff. Just it it goes against the grain. Um, looking at people here, all nodding. Everybody's obviously the same mindset. Like you have an animal, you have a hell of a lot of responsibility for it. Um, we didn't have chickens as pets. Dad didn't let us name them because we ate them in the fall. Um, I think you made great points that would if if it went by law, vacuum it out six times a year well yeah that automatically i had already my schematics of course i had a dairy goats thank you mike for introducing that yes. to my life had 27 dairy goats um local farmers came and made fun of my barn because i swept it out it was so spotless my goats were shiny i brought them to the massey fair people laughed at their bandanas and outfits because I'm over the top husbandry, everything lives three times its flipping lifespan in my home. So my chicken coop would be that, but I don't think I'm common in that aspect, unfortunately. Uh, my brother is the opposite spectrum. He would tie a string around the chicken's leg and call it good enough. Um, I do want this to have a shot at going forward. I think this is another hot topic like trailer licensing that would require um, community input, pros, cons, coming up with all your thoughts, keeping in mind what it will cost the community to go forward. Like, you know, uh, Councilor Crafts pointed out, like, what does it cost us to even make a bylaw? I spend, <laughs> I buy over a dozen eggs a week. We eat a lot of them. Chicken food's 1847 for a 50 pound bag two chickens consume a quarter cup a day it would cost me 50 bucks feed wise roughly my first year construction investment would have to be twelve hundred dollars if i went all brand new if i went to rona i can buy an off the shop coop 650 up to 1200 or and i can also buy all the fencing there to do their coop depending on how much i want to spend it is not cheap it is not cheap investment. I'm thinking I probably need 1500 the first year, <laughs> but then I don't. That's my plus side. I'm always, you know, rainbow and, and silver linings. But then after that, it, it's, you know, price going down. Necropsy, absolutely. If I have four chickens, I go out, two are dead. The first thing I'm going to do, why? Who threw mm -hmm. some, and I'm going to go, you know, dark side, who threw something in my coop and poisoned them, what neighbors are hating on me because I have them. Um, oh, they're missing their eyeballs and their faces ripped off. I got a raccoon. Um, but I think as a flock owner, I would want to know that. As soon as I go to that point, I do believe public health mandatory sends that, shares that information publicly if I have an outbreak. I'm trying to remember back, I mean, I worked for a vet, but it was 30 years ago, and I cannot remember all, all of our rules and details. Um, the feather dust, absolutely, 100% with you. You're supposed to wash your budgie every week, too. Who does? <laughs> they have it in your house. You know, you're supposed to miss your canaries and your songbirds that you keep in that cage twice a week. Any feathered pet is supposed to be washed on a weekly basis. And I don't mean just a squirt, I mean washed. 
Um, I washed carrots constantly. It was a nonstop part of my job. So I don't think we need to panic over outdoor chicken feather dust off of, again, when you come up with numbers for max. I think we have to be really reasonable. But on the flip side of it, this year, that avian flu is a bugger. Toronto Metro Zoo locked down their birds. We can't risk, uh, and I mean, we're so sick of the, of the COVID and this constantly being depressed because of, of that stuff. But it scared me when like a really reputable zoos are locking down their, their bird exhibits because they're afraid that something's gonna kill all those exotics. And then I think about, you know, like Maple Leaf and where we get our food from in the grocery store. They don't want an outbreak of avian flu because that will kill the Maple Leaf or Maple, no, what's it called? Maple Lodge. I don't know, maple whoever Lodge. we buy our maple. Maple Lodge, <laughs> Schneider's, you know, so I know big business is behind that trying to protect themselves. I know that um, the municipalities in Southern Ontario, a few of them have put out these extra stipulations on current flock owners Flock being one chicken or however many to wear booties, not like your kids near them. And they've assigned one person per household. Other municipalities are calling with no questions asked right now. They're coming in. It's done. Um, I think I see a chicken lady that in the front. <laughs> they, chicken people um, that I had background with or business with they're really protective of their flocks oh can i go see your chickens no oh <laughs> why you might give them something oh <laughs> okay so there is so many aspects to it i do want to have this open for discussion i do want this to be open-minded because i personally myself would like to be part of this but i wanted to succeed and with all the aspects that are against it this year um i don't think we could i think this might be the year to hammer out details ideas frameworks um get people who have chickens in rural to help create the handouts the information the husbandry the all that stuff to share if it does go forward but um I think this is the year for, for hammering out paperwork, for sure, for getting the ideas, for getting, again, a rough draft schematically put out, shared with the public, get feedback back. So that's all I, I think I have to say. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Councillor Mitchie. Okay, so I spent quite a bit of time looking at pros and cons, far way out, outweighed by the pros. And now I can't remember where everybody's concerned, but I'll go back to Mayor Burke. So your first one was noise? No, public health. Well, public health. Okay, so does anyone want to hazard a guess? And I got this from the WHO site. Uh, from 2013 to 2023, how many avian flu cases were transferred to humans in those 10 years span? Anybody want to have worldwide? Well, worldwide. Um, I'm zero in Canada, so I yeah, zero in Canada. So 1,568 worldwide, a population of 8 billion people. Most of those were in poor, underdeveloped countries, sanitation, uh, health care. Uh, CDC, U.S., in the last year, one case of avian flu transferred to a human, mild symptoms for three days. And this was uh, a person that was slaughtering a large, well, part of an organization that went to slaughter a large commercial operation where there's no known case of having a few backyard chickens that I could find anywhere that were, were contracted avian flu. These diseases come from large commercial centers where it's not sanitary, poor ventilation. These chickens are crammed butt to gut and they're practically pretty much in their own feces all the time, right? So of course, if you pack a thousand people together in a building and have those conditions, yeah, we'll spread illness pretty quick. Um, the last case reported in Canada was in 2019. So, and Mayor Burke, uh, you, you said a noise complaint. So what was the complaint? Property standard. No, okay, no, property standard. I didn't yeah. say there were, but there is. Been no, but, okay, so where do you think that noise is going to come from? What's Roosters. Okay, so if you read the bylaw, we do our research. No bylaws allow rooster. No roosters. It's hens only. So yeah, it's hens only. And but we're not. The hen after we're not there yet. We're okay. Not at the bylaw yet. 
Right, but I mean, we have to, you know, when we're presenting facts and you're saying yeah. one of the concerns could be yeah. noise, yeah, I don't want to lose your way from me up at six o'clock. I'm right, nobody. <laughs> Ship, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no roosters. And if you if you took four hens, it's 50 to 60 decibels, which is a human conversation. So that's not going to be an issue. So um, anybody else? Maybe we can go around again. Marianne, what were your concerns? And I can address those. And I have all the links to reputable sites that people want to, to go through. Yeah. Um, so I'll give you what the people voiced me. It was the uh, disposal of the waste, mm -hmm. um, rodents, mm -hmm. um, flies, chickens buck, buck, bucking. <laughs> um, th those were the, the main things. It was the, the disposal of, of waste and um, and yeah, and and how are they going to be able to fit properly in a yard? Can I think like the, the required yeah. area for the yeah. 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 So okay. So as far as yeah. disposal of chicken manure, there's uh, very strict bylaws. All of them you have to clean the coop daily. Yeah. It has to be disposed of properly. No different than when you're picking up your cat or your yeah. dog waste, right? You can't just chuck that. That has to be disposed of properly. People probably don't do it religiously. I know I do. Um, and as far as the clucking, well, I'd rather have a little cluck cluck than a bark 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 all night. Uh, as far as rodents. Well, one lady had said, you know, I'm concerned, but, you know, I see coyotes all the time. Yeah. Well, we don't have any chickens, but we've got coyotes in the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. we're going to blame that on chickens. And we know every year we talk about bear-wise, right? What draws bears into town? Bird feeders. Should we just eliminate all bird feeders? Then we don't want a, you don't yeah. want a bear coming into town. So if you have, you know, I grew up on a farm all my life. We had every animal under the sun. We never lost a chicken to sickness. They probably died of old age or the time came, they went into a pot never lost its proper care of them the bylaws are very strict toronto has one they just are just now are expanding on it after their pilot project their city council approved extending the pilot and added additional awards to the program they're expanding on this and right now i know everybody's talking about you know avian flu there is an outbreak down there yes the zoo they've closed down their uh, bird exhibits there's not one of all the dead birds that have arrived, or migratory birds that have arrived, they have a center right now. They're just on precaution down a couple hundred kilometers from Toronto, where again a large commercial operation has an outbreak of avian flu. So, um, and we talked about chicken wing dust. Well, that dust prevents chickens from being fed on by mites. That's why they have it. It's a natural defense. So if you're going to vacuum out, you're not protecting your chicken from illness. And, you know, we talked about cost of setup. Yeah, sure. It costs a lot of money. And, you know, some people say, well, why do you want to spend $1,200 to collect, you know, a couple dozen eggs a week? Well, it's a hobby. I, I look at people buying these $40,000 side-by-sides, and I say, what, what a waste of money. Go for a walk in the bush. So who are we to decide what your, your fee should be, correct? Right. Um, so who's going to police that? Well, we have a bylaw officer, right? So we police that like we should be enforcing everything else. Yeah, it's, it's and, and the thing is, in order to do this, we have fees in place, right? So you have to pay, like Mr. Uh, Councillor Burns had said, there's fees in place. We pay permits. Toronto, I think, charges 100 bucks a year. I'm pretty sure that's going to cover the cost of our bylaw officer. So going to say, yeah, you're up to standard. You know, good job, Mike. Carry on. For a couple dozen families that want to have chickens in urban well, areas. Well, and, and, you know, who are we to say you can't have that? And, you know, Bucky, I know you had some, or Councillor Krabs, <laughs> you, uh, you, know, you talked about the, uh, you know, the field beds and the tile drainage. Well, coops are raised off the ground, two or three feet. Snow's going to get underneath there. That's going to insulate. That'll insulate your field bed and your, and your drainage lines. Um, this is regulation. This is provincial regulations of the, the, the health unit. Yep. That you can't have them near your tile bed. Okay, well, I didn't find that anywhere. But if that's the case, then you know, if you if your lot doesn't allow for it, then under the bylaw, then tough, right? Um, so you know, I, I'm thinking if Toronto can do this, I'm pretty sure we can do it. Aurelia has it. Kingston, there's major centers that allow it. Um, there's a bunch. You know, they talked about well, chickens. Why uh, these chickens attract uh, you know rodents? Well, if there's a food supply, they'll come. Right? Yeah. Bird feeders attract skunks, which are predators. They attract raccoons. They attract bears. Yeah. If you're a responsible owner and you're supposed to be under the bylaw, 
your food has to be in airtight, rodent proof containers. Again, the bylaw officer enforces that. And any reasonable person that's doing this will put them in pails of some sort to make them airtight. A chicken eats a, a half a cup of, of uh, chicken feet a day, but these will be free ranging. They have to stay in a run. They're not running around your yard. They have to stay in a, in a run. Um, they clean up most pests around, right? They'll eat, uh, you know, we're always worried about ticks, etc. They'll clean up ticks. Um, small flocks, there has been no, zero risk of spreading avian flu to human, uh, humans. And that's right from the Center of Disease Control. In fact, directly in the Center of Disease Control website, it states that there is no need at present time to remove a family of flock chickens because of its current concerns regarding avian flu. Um, and they talk about you know, the myths about attracting you know, pests and rodents. That's, that's not true. It's like they, they can if you're not doing it properly. If you're careless. If you're careless, absolutely. And there are people that are going to be careless. Yeah, they're careless with their pets too. And, and, and our ability to, to control that is bad enough right now. We'd have to double, we'd have to double our property standards of budget to, to even come close to this. So we talk about soil contamination, right? So four chickens pooping on the ground. Meanwhile, dogs are crapping all over. One average sized dog will produce 10 times the waste that 10 chickens will do. Meanwhile, I see people going around their yards with uh, Roundup carcinogenic. We don't control that. Where do you think that's going? I'd rather have a bit of chicken crap in my yard than some of the spring of Roundup. And you know, we talked about, you know, using chicken manure, you know, it's gonna cause soil contamination. So spring is coming pretty soon. Drive by any hardware store, any nursery, Canadian Tire, any grocery store. How many bags of cow and sheep manure do they sell every year for us to take home, put in your flower bed, and put in your garden? So are we selecting which type of manure is going to be an issue to the groundwater? Uh, noise, well, we talked about that. The hand is not too loud. And, and I agree, Mayor Burke, we shouldn't have roosters, and no bylaws allow roosters. I can go on and on about the benefits. Um, so then I know, Councillor Burns, you talked about diseases that we can get from, from chicken poop. Um, so uh, let me just pull this up. There's, okay, here we go. With, with cat waste and dog waste, there is 15 different toxins and stuff you can get from that. Can I join in on you with that? Yeah. Actually? Um, when I was discussing the avian flu, I wasn't even thinking of humans. I'm sorry if that yeah. was how it came across. Yeah. I was thinking about how it transfers from one bird to another. Mm -hmm. um, right now, you're right. The, the cross species, um, transdermal um, relationship of, the, of that disease, it, it, it's not almost non-existent. But I knew Mike was going with this. Um, we can catch worse from, you know. Um, it, which, it is jumping to it. It is. It has. It has transferred skunks. to skunks in BC. They have got some cases of it crossing the the mammal dermal um, because the skunks um, got in contact with the flock. So again, mm -hmm. those circumstances were also not necessarily detailed. It has crossed. It has crossed that that barrier. Um, whether it was at a huge slaughterhouse and it got them. Who knows how that happens, but it is not common. Um, I just want to put that out there for that to happen. The E. coli of what you had brought up, though, that is found commonly so often. And unfortunately, we buy our kids lizards and turtles, and they're the top ones from pet stores that transfer to children under the age of 10 above almost anything else. And it's the reptilian. Um, I always was given the example that if you have a pet lizard, it's like taking a raw piece of chicken. That is about the same bacterial. So, and I like reptiles and I love, I have pet snake, you know, got no problem with any of that. Um, but you have to keep that mindset. So my great nephew just got lizard and I keep telling his mom, it's like you're giving him a piece of chicken to play with. Just remember, wash those hands and he can't let the lizard run up everywhere. Um, but with disease from, from chickens, I, I, I have to piggyback with Mike on that. I can't see it being an issue. And, and then everything else that you brought up, I'm just, 
I, I, don't, I, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm for investigating this idea in depth and more thoroughly. When you're talking about cost, I wanted to say, again, it's investment, initial investment. But after that, if I'm spending five bucks a week, and I am like spending five bucks a week on eggs, <laughs> it has added up that it would be cheaper for me by the few years in. And you're right, it's hobby and it's mental health too. I think again, plays into that. And, and I'm not gonna go on all night. I mean, we can go on, we bang on about this all day. I've got tons of paper here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if, if anybody wants, I've got all the links that I can send to you know, the mayor and council. Yeah. Um, Diane Emery has reached out, and I think what the issue is is like we're not educated. I see people commenting, "Oh, the smell." Well, you know what? It doesn't stink any more than dog crap or cat crap or cat urine is the worst, right? So, what are we going to do? We're not going to eliminate pets and soil contamination, but I think it just needs to come down to education. So, Diane was saying that if we can move past this to at least discuss it and have public input on it, she'd be willing to come in. And, you know, the Emory's are very respected farmers in this area. They know their stuff. She is willing to come in and provide education to the public and to council as well, too, um, to, to educate us on the benefits of chickens. And, you know, if there is some cons, Diane, will, I'm sure, will be very straight up with that. But I think right now it might be a little premature to say, oh, no, scrap it here. We're done. We're not even going to entertain this. I mean, we have rate pairs that are interested. A lot of people have reached out. Let's at least give them an option like we did with the, the trader bylaw. And I'm grateful that we're going to go ahead and you know open that can of worms again. That's all I'm asking. I have a question, actually. Yes, um, if something is done as a pilot project, just because this would be a good idea to do this. So like if something's done as a pilot project and say it's like, okay, so after we get all the details and ideas in a, in a nice template and this is how you do it, if it started as a pilot project and given like a, a start date and end date with an option to extend, and somebody takes the lead to a volunteer of the pilot. Pro like if there is such community involvement, somebody volunteers, like I'll check the coops. Like, can we have like a temporary stand in person for that? Does this then require a whole bunch of zoning changes and funding rather than like going and changing everything hardcore? Does a pilot project allow for more flexibility with creating something? Just a thought. I don't know, but if that's something to look into, if it has like a deadline date and, Here's how we do it. And somebody would have to come up with the whole design of like, okay, well, we can't put everything on our bylaw inspector because you're right. We want to have it success. Mm -hmm. So if we had, you know, somebody that's like, hey, I've had chickens. I know what I'm doing. I don't mind uh, 30 people apply year one. Like if you could put a number on who participates yeah. maybe for year one and do like beta testing. And then we have, okay, well, we had 20 people apply and, They've got the schematics and they set up and then like, and then you have it limited. Like, I just don't know if, if rather than worrying about like zoning it and having it go more hardcore, if it's just a smaller way to micro organize it. Yeah. Um, with most of the municipalities that I looked at that did a pilot project, the number that were given permission were very, it was very small, like six, mm -hmm. six. So it's it's very very limited, because um, um, they're using the public and, project to look for the issues, right? Yeah, to, yeah, to correct. see to see if it works, to see if there uh, are a lot of bylaw issues, uh, enforcement issues. You know how it's going. Yeah, that's it. And it's I think most municipalities are going with it like two years. And then, like it's taken a half, two years, and then now it's full of bylaw or whatever. Um, but another thing that um, in Toronto, I know that they have a program for those who don't want to have a chicken coop in their yard, where you rent a chicken. Yeah. And and so like I don't know like in the interim, like what if we're trying to study this and. See if it's feasible. If that's if that's something, I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> and I agree on that. I don't think we should go full bar and say, okay, everybody who wants chickens, or maybe yeah. maybe only a handful of people want to have them. And you know, like Councillor Crab said, maybe only a handful will be you know able to accommodate that under the strict rules, right? But I think in general, there's probably plenty of room to, to do it. I know a lot of people have 
you know, double lots. They have a corner lot that's bigger. But, you know, we'll put the bylaws in place. And I, I think we at least owe it to have a pilot project. And, you know, Marianne, that's a good point in saying that, you know, we're going to limit it to, say, six in Massey, if you got that many, six in Webwood, six in Malford. But, I mean, again, just to, to scrap it and throw it aside, because we've already, you know, if you look at soil contamination, we also proved that there's all kinds of forms of soil, uh, soil contamination. Like I said, I'd rather four chickens pooping on my lawn than spraying Roundup and commercial fertilizer that's oil-based, petroleum-based. And you know, if you look at our local farmers too, I grew up in a farm too. What did you do every fall? You harvested your crop. We had our dug well out in the field where cows roamed and ate. And in the fall, we plowed it. We loaded up the manure spreader. We filled that field with manure. We tilled her under to ensure we get a good crop next year. None of us ever got sick drinking our water. <laughs> None of us. So I, I, there's a lot of scare hype, you know. And yeah, we, you know, I think there's some overreaction. Everybody's hypersensitive with the whole COVID lockdown. We shut the whole world down, and now we're saying, "Oh my God, avian flu! This is the next thing. This is going to come on and terrify us." There's there's 1,500, less than 1,600 people have a population of eight billion worldwide in 10 years. So that's 160 a year. And we're panicky here in Canada. So, okay, we've been around the table a couple of times here. I've got a couple of resolutions that we can vote on. Uh, be it resolved that we agree to examine the potential for backyard chickens as an urban agricultural use and that J.L. Richards be requested to provide consultation and a draft bylaw that would provide sufficient regulations and setback requirements for further review. Got a mover. Mike Machika, second. Councillor Fairburn, all in favor? I'd like a recorded vote, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have to think of it. Yeah. Okay. I need to think. Councillor Burns. No. Nope. Councillor Machika. Sorry, I'm in favor of it. Okay. Yeah. Councillor no. Krabs. Councillor Fairburn. This is to whether to investigate it, to, right? Yeah, we're going to discuss further. Yeah. Yes. To discuss further. Yeah. Councillor Hobbs. <laughs> And I'm not in favor. So the next resolution is be it resolved that after due consideration, council confirms the position to not permit the raising of backyard chickens in the urban areas of the municipality. Have a mover. Councillor Fairburn. Second, Councillor uh, Burns. <laughs> recorded vote. Is that correct? Does anybody want a recorded vote? So, are we moving forward? At least wait until if we can get Diane to give us some education. I think what's happening here is it's lack of education. I mean, it, it, you can you can take any animal out there and say, you know, you know, look where we had mad mad cow disease with yeah. cattle. Do we call it? We're done debating. I pay. That's fine. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm I'm still in favor of it. But anyway, council confirms the position to not permit the raising of backyard chickens in urban areas of the municipality. I will request. Council Grabs. Councillor Merchika. Councillor Fairburn. Gary.
Yes. Okay, moving on. Bylaw to amend the fire department bylaw. Uh, did everybody look that over? Uh, so at, at finance, they talked about training department staff, mm -hmm. and we discussed in increasing fire prevention officers honorarium. So that's what this is to amend that schedule. Now there was a typo on the appendix. No, I fixed it. Okay. <laughs> the real one has the right. Okay, perfect. Should be a thousand under the yeah. Okay. Last step. So be it resolved that bylaw twenty twenty three dash one two being a bylaw for the purpose of amending a bylaw to establish and regulate a fire department be read a first and second time. Could I have a motion? Councillor Fairburn, second. Councillor Hobbs, all in favor? Very. And be it resolved that bylaw 2023 12 being a bylaw for the purpose of amending a bylaw to establish and regulate fire department be read a third and final time and passed an open council. We have a motion. Councillor Fairburn, second. Councillor Hobbs, all in favor? Carried. Um, that's okay, okay so we've next covered, we've covered yeah. the last yeah. Yeah. so just we're going to go into closed yeah. session. Yeah, closed session. session. Um, anything else anybody wants to anything anybody wants to bring up before we go into closed session? Mm -hmm. No, no issue. Okay. <laughs> it resolved that we move into closed session at 829 p.m. pursuant to section 239.2 of the municipal act to consider personal matters about identifiable individuals including municipal or local board employees could have a mover councillor fairburn second councillor Krabs. all in favor hey, wait, do you get an amendment the town office won't be a saving time <laughs> <laughs> All in favor, 